joining us for Bible study on tonight. Our scripture will come from Deuteronomy 31, verses 6 through 8. And I'm going to read a portion of it. Deuteronomy 31, verses 6 through 8. And it says, Be strong and bold, because it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Deuteronomy 31, verses 6 through 8. A portion of it, I'll read it again. Be strong and bold, because it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. And our song is, God Never Fails. tonight to the top of page 43 before we begin another section we will stop amen tonight's 
lesson is built around God speaks to his people. God has always developed a way in which he has spoken to his people, and he is still speaking to his people today. Amen? Amen. The God we serve is still speaking. Even in our midst today, he is speaking to his people. God has not changed. He still speaks to his people. God is immutable, meaning that God does not change. He is immutable. I M M U T A B L E. God is immutable. He never, never changes. He is the same God that He's always been. He never changes. And He's always looking out for us, yes? yes. yes. He is always considering Thank us. You. Thank you. Psalm, the psalmist in Psalm 8 says, What is man that God is so mindful of him that he has made him a little lower than the angels? What is man? He goes on to say, Oh, the Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. He is the excellent and the amazing God. It's an amazing thing that God himself, as amazing he is, he still want to talk to us. <laughs> He's not like us. We get to a point where we got a dime over a dollar we want to select who we talk to. We get to a point where we've been saved for two hours and now we're too much and too spiritual to talk to. Us. But here we are looking at the amazing, almighty, all conferencing all God's, all present, all knowing, all potent, all powerful God, and he wants to speak to us. <clears throat> he is merciful and he is God all by himself. He is God all by himself. He is God all by himself. Yes? When we look at our book, the first paragraph, I, I think I, I'm the one to read that. Sister Whitlock, can you read that first paragraph on, on page 42? First paragraph on page 42, then I'm going to ask your husband to interpret what it's saying. Amen. Amen. Look at God. We are one. We are one. Hallelujah. First, first two paragraphs, I guess. Years ago, I spoke to a group of young pastors when I finished the first session. A pastor took me inside and said, I vow to God I would never again listen to a man like you. You talk as though God is personal and talks to you. I just despise that. I asked him, are you having difficulty letting God speak to you? He and I talked, and before long, we were on our knees. He wept and thanked God that he had spoken to him. Don't let anyone intimidate you about hearing from God. Amen. 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 She ran all over that first first period. I mean, she, she said, she said, when I run enough to when I finish. <laughs> I thought it was the same part of the same sentence for a while. Years ago I spoke to a, a group of young pastors when I finished the section. The young guy pulled me over to the side. Yes. Okay, I gave Little Whitlock time to to consider what what this is all about. God speaks to his people. God speaks to his people. Well, it is as she read. Um, <laughs> Tell us about it. Tell us about as he read. He was, said he was talking to some young pastors, and apparently one of them felt as if they had never actually heard from God, which is it's strange because he's a pastor, <laughs> but that's that's the way it, it seems. So uh, that young pastor um, had mentioned that he would never talk to someone like him again uh, because he made it seem as though God is personal and actually does does talk to you. So again, I'm wondering why he how he became a young pastor. <laughs> All right. Uh, but then the uh, the author uh, asked the young pastor if he was having trouble letting God speak to him. And so 
they talked and then they had prayed and then the young pastor, uh, I guess he finally opened up to allowing God to talk to him because he wept and he thanked God that he had spoken to uh, the author. So then the author finishes off with, don't let anyone intimidate you about hearing from God. Amen. So people believe that when God speaks, it's mystical. Ooh. It's mystical. It's, and when you talk about the Holy Spirit or you mention the Holy Ghost, they think it's a ghost that comes through. First of all, they're wrong in the fact that they think the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost is a it. The Holy Spirit is a he. He's intelligent. He's the third person of the triune God. He's God himself. And when, when we go through these, these other verses, we will, we, will dis, we will discover that God is still speaking and he has a detonated dispensation the way he speaks at a detonated time. That's a good word for a sign, dispensation. You'll find that it's a detonated time. But when we talk about it in the Bible, what do we talk about when we say dispensation? One example is Jesus was on the scene, and when Jesus was on the scene, there was no presence of the ever-present dwelling of the Holy Spirit. They didn't need the Holy Spirit to, to always dwell with them because Jesus was here. Before Jesus, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit hovered over the earth. He hovered over the earth and he made things happen through his hovering over the earth. After Jesus left, then we now know that this present day dispensation in which we live, uh, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God the Father lives in us. He lives in us. He resides in us. He is forever in us once we come to Jesus Christ. He resides in us. He dwells there. He lives there. He is the Holy Spirit. Look at God. He is the Holy Spirit. He is God all by himself. So this young, this young pastor, and Brother Whitlock said, I wanted I get to be a pastor. He couldn't hear from God. Mm -hmm. There are some who went, and there were some who sent, who were sent. Some who were sent, they were sent by God, sent by the Holy Spirit. But then there are some who went. So tell me, why would a man choose to preach if God didn't call him? What's some of the reasons why people choose to preach? Money. Money. He need to come by the New Beginning Church. <laughs> money. If he thinks he's going to get a lot of money, he needs to be indoctrinated. And in any, any small church, you, you need to be indoctrinated to what really goes on. So y'all think that preachers call themselves to preach because of money, okay? Any other reason they call themselves to preach? Prestige. 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 They're in where we have the lust of the pride of life. Lusting for the pride of life. Prestige. I'm somebody. You can tell when men uh, think they're somebody, they're going to use their title mm -hmm. every single time, even when it's inappropriate to use it. So we have money, we have prestige. Why do preachers call themselves to preach and don't wait on God? I've heard that they call themselves to preach because they think they can do things that they normally wouldn't be able to do. They can do what they want to do. Now. So they can do some things that they need to come by the New Beginning Church for that. I just can't do what I want to do. <laughs> just can't just wake up one day and say, this is what I'm going to do. It has to go through prayer. It has to go through the advice of other people. And then we make a decision. Any, any, any other reason why preachers choose to call themselves to preach? I know uh, some may feel because of their, uh, their ancestors or their family members took them Okay. And have so it's a family affair. It's a, oh, okay. it's a family affair. It's a family affair. So 
So um, just the other day, a guy said to me, I didn't know he had a line of preachers. He came from a family of preachers. That's good sometimes, sometimes it's not. Okay, any other reason? Now let me switch courses. Why would teachers choose to teach themselves? Why would they choose to call themselves to teach? For the love of the children. For the love of children, all right. Okay. Anybody else? Why would people self proclaim their teaching? Yes, ma'am. They don't like what they're being taught by others. Oh, I can do it better than you can. I don't like what you're doing, so I'm going to show you. When I read this story, it reminded me of an of a, of a event. And now that you've said that, it reminded me of another event. Um, when I became the pastor of New Beginning Church, the first six months were turmoil. I mean, the river was raging. So we were in a meeting and the brother said, man, you haven't said anything to me the whole time you've been here, the whole four months you've been here. You had, your preaching has not touched me. I could have said some other things, but I wanted to remain pastoral. So I said, okay, Sunday morning, uh, when you get there, I'm gonna announce you as a preacher. And he knew I was crazy enough to do it. <laughs> I said, since I can't do it, I know you can do better. So I'm going to stand before the church and announce you as the new preacher. Not the pastor, but the new preacher. And he's going to do it better than, he, he, than I could ever do it. Well, he came that morning and dropped off some utensils for communion and got out of there before I got He must have come real early that morning. Because he knew, Brother Brown, that I was crazy enough. And he, he said, don't be playing with the church like that. No, this is something that you want to do. And I know you can do it better than I can. You just said that I haven't been speaking to you. So let me let you speak to me. Boy, he did. Don't let the guy. <laughs> He's gone. The other thing that this story reminds me of when it talks about a young man who pulled the speaker over in the off in this case, pulled him over and said that I had declared in my mind that I would never listen to another preacher like you. I will never listen to a preacher like you because you think and you act like God talks directly to you. For 12 years I preached at the, the Star of Hope mission, doing missions, and I noticed every single time I went down there, there was a guy sitting in the far corner. He would never show any emotions, wouldn't say amen, wouldn't come up for altar call. He was in a homeless shelter. These guys coming up and they're breaking down in tears. I mean, they're declaring their love for the Lord. But for 12 years, he never moved. One night, he came down the center aisle with tears screaming down his face. And he came and he received Jesus Christ. And these were his words. He said to me, for 12 years I watched you talk about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. I got sick and tired of you talking about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Every time you showed up, you didn't do what the other preachers did. You talked about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And he said to me, he said, man, I looked for an opportunity to get you by yourself so I could kill you. Because I got sick and tired of you talking about Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection. And he said, after 12 years, you never changed the message. And because of that, I want to give my life to Christ. Woo! I wouldn't have even met y'all. Isn't that something? He said to me, after 12 years of listening to you, after I had declared that I was going to get you alone and kill you, I want to give my life to Christ. So people choose to do things for all kinds of reasons. You never know what's going on in folks' minds. Woo, good God Almighty. So we have to come to the conclusion that our message must not change. We may use different methods, but we must have the same, same message. The message 
must not change. Doesn't matter how many degrees you get, your message must remain the same. That's why we extend the, the invitation during Sunday school. We extend, extend the invitation during Bible study. We extend the invitation on Sunday morning during worship because you never know who's sitting in the audience, who's listening online, that need to know Jesus. That needed to know him and wanted to know him and didn't even know that he needed to know him. Isn't that something? We don't even know what we need to know. It's kind of like with children. We have to expose children to all good things because at the end of the day, children don't know what they want. They can say what they want. But they, they haven't lived long enough to know what they want. We have to expose them to good things. So when we expose them to good things, then they are able to determine what they want to do. So we have to make sure that we stay with the Lord, keep the same message, maintain the same message. Who's my next reader? John chapter 4, no, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Sister Woods, I think. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and then she's going to answer questions A and B. Hebrews 1, 1 through 2. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Okay. Question was statement A. In the Old Testament, time passed. How and through whom did God speak? He spoke to him at different times. And I think he spoke to him by way of his prophets. Okay, he spoke by way of his prophets, right? Yeah. And check out what it says. Long ago, thank you, Sister Woods. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets. Now, if it says long ago, how long ago? Long time ago. When did he speak to his prophets? A long time ago. Brother Miles, what is that saying? He spoke to his prophets long ago. What is that saying? Years and years ago. It says that the era of speaking through the prophets is over. Okay. He says long ago. When I asked him, he hesitated. I thought he was going to say long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Long ago, God spoke directly to men, and he did it by way of the prophets. And he did it different times and in different ways. He spoke to the, he spoke to the prophets, and the prophets spoke to the people. So Brother Miles said, now nah, I didn't say it. Brother Miles said the days of God speaking to us by way of the prophets now those days are over. So in the 20th century, in the 21st century, why do we have men who call themselves prophets and women who call themselves prophetess? I'm waiting on you. Talk to me. Why? The Bible says, e Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, it was a long time ago. Now here we are in this time. And we still have modern day prophets. And we still have modern day prophetess. They went. They went. <laughs> and they wasn't sent. <laughs> Brother Whitlock said that. I didn't say that. <laughs> so long ago, long ago, God spoke to us by way of prophets. Yes, ma'am. So, they sister. think that they tell you that they hear from God when they don't. Okay. So she says that that um, that they tell you that they hear from God, and then they're going to give you the word from God. Yes. And it's not unusual for a flyer to be out in the in the post office or 
or on social media or, or email or website that says, come and see this prophet. Come and hear from this prophetess. But the text says, this happened long ago. I'm not saying anything. I'm just, I'm just part of the conversation. But I do say, if you read the word, the word will speak to you. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, Long ago God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets at different times and in different ways. So this word says, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So, Sister so Woods, you're going to take B. I, I guess I set you down too quickly. Huh? That's okay. I, I just got excited when I saw it. You already answered the question. B. B says, in the New Testament time, these last days, how did God speak? Through his son. So God spoke through his son. In the Old Testament, he spoke long ago. He spoke by way of his prophets. In the New Testament, he spoke by way of his son. That's why when Jesus spoke, he was really setting the course and putting things in action to let people know that he has power over the things on this earth. Jesus just didn't deliver people from stuff just so he can brag about it. Matter of fact, there were some times when Jesus healed somebody, he says, don't even tell anybody. Are you with me? So, Jesus had a purpose for everything he did. When he healed this man in Mark chapter 5 that was running crazy in the graveyard, verses 1 through 20, the Bible says that they could not shackle him, they could not chain him. When they did chain him and shackle him, he broke the chains. He broke the shackles. So that was a statement from Jesus. In verse number six, it says, when Jesus showed up, he ran and worshiped him. He had a change in his heart. He didn't need chains on his wrist and his legs. What that says to us is that Jesus has control and power over demons. If you keep reading, there, there's a trilogy of truths in Mark chapter 5. You have the woman with the issue of blood there. This woman has been hemorrhaging, bleeding for 12 years. The Bible said all these people surrounded Jesus. And she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. I will be made whole. This woman walked through the crowd, kneeled down, and touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and the flow dried up. That says that Jesus has power over our sicknesses. Jesus is laying it out for us. He has power. First, it shows over the demons. Then it shows over our sicknesses. And then, wow, we move from verses 1 through 20, there's Jairus there. Jairus' daughter is dying. And in the midst of it, the woman shows up. Jesus has agreed to go and, 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 and heal Jairus' daughter, but the woman shows up, and a lot of preachers said it wasn't even the woman time, and Jesus gave her time. This woman shows up. She's been hemorrhaging. She touches the hem of his garment. Let me just say, the power was not in the H-E-M-M. -M. The power was in the capital H-I-M-M. -M. Jesus has power over sickness. Now, Jairus' daughter is dying. She messes around and dies. Jesus heals the woman that's already dead. She gets up. This says to us that Jesus has power over death and the grave. So it's nothing mystical about it. It's just the fact that Jesus has all power. No one has the power that Jesus has. He has all power. So in these latter days, God has been speaking through his son. Who has John 14, verse 26? 
and that person is going to handle C and D. John 14, verse 26. The counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have told you. Mm -hmm. In John 14, 26, whom did Jesus call the Father who sins in his name? What is the work of the Holy Spirit as described in John 14, 26 and 16, 13 through 14? Let's see. Mm -hmm. You won't give us the answer. In John 14, 26, whom did Jesus promise? It says whom, not what, right? Uh, his disciples, didn't he? Listen to the question. Whom did Jesus promise the Father would sin in his name? Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come, right? Yeah. Okay, the next one. What is the work of the Holy Spirit as described in John 14, 26 is when you read Let's look back up there, John 14, 26. First of all, he calls him the counselor. Yes. yes. The Holy Spirit is his name. Whom the Father will send in my name, or send in Jesus' name, and he will do what? What's the first thing he does? He will teach you all things. What's the next thing he does? He will remind you of everything I have told you. Thank you. So he says... He says that he's going to remind you of what Jesus has said. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are on one accord. The Holy Spirit won't come on the scene until the Son has left the scene. So God the Father introduces Jesus to the earth. Then Jesus introduces the Holy Spirit to the earth. And now we're living in these days where the Holy Spirit is residing with us. It's living in us. So I think Sister Davis is next. So the Holy Spirit is walking in us. He's living in us. He's dwelling in us. He is God the Holy Spirit. He is in us. Okay, John, John 16, verses 13 through 14. Okay, John 16, verses 13 through 14. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Ooh, and then um, E says, who is the one who hears what God says? Uh, God will speak through those who are his children, the saved ones. Is that correct? I'm okay. <laughs> All right, and then John 8, 47. The one who is from God listens to God's words. This is why you don't listen. This is why you don't listen, because you are not from God. Okay, and then the uh, question is, uh, what does John 8, 47 say about a person who does not hear what God says? Uh, that person is not from God, which I interpret that person is not saved. Okay, let's back up to E. Let's back up to John 16, verses 13 through 14. 16, verses 13 through 14. Look at it. Read it very slowly here. Okay. When the Spirit of truth comes. When the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, they, they call him Counselor. They called him God. Now they're calling him the Holy Spirit. He the, will the guide, Spirit of truth, bro. Right. He will guide you into all the truth. He will guide you into everything that's true that I've already been telling you. Okay? Okay. For he will not speak on his own. Because he's not going to speak something new when he gets here. He's not going to speak on his own. He's going to speak in, in, in the same manner that I spoke. Yes. Right. But he will speak whatever he hears. He? Who is the he we're talking about? 
The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who does what? Speak what he hears. He speaks what he hears, right? Now let's stop right there. Let's look at E down here. Let's look at this question. Who is the one who hears what God says? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, right? So the Holy Spirit hears what God says. Let's read further. We're still in John 16, 13 through 14. He will glorify. He will also declare to you what is to come. Okay, he will declare to you what is to come, right? Mm -hmm. So he's going to tell you. Now, Jesus already told us what's going to come, right? He's going to be in agreement with what Jesus said. And then he's not only going to be in agreement with what Jesus says, he's not going to come with a new message and speak something different. The problem with many preachers and teachers is that we teach and preach something differently than what God has said. How do we know that it's different? Because it's not saturated with the word of God. That which is saturated with the word of God, that which is true, that's what we ought to teach and preach. That's why we have concordances. That's why we do research. That's why we read books. It's because sometimes we need to make sure that we write about something. Now, I'm not too keen on commentaries, but when it comes to concordance, when it comes to a concordance, you're going to say what God is saying if you don't tell the truth of God. If you say anything other than what God is saying, then you tell a lie. And guess who you lied on? You lied on God. And I'll give you an example here in a minute. So, so since David says he will also declare to you what is to come. He's going to tell you the future. We don't need the prophets anymore, right? What did the prophets do? They told the future. So here it is now. The Holy Spirit is telling the future. He will glorify me. Will he glorify me? He said, the, the scripture says he will glorify me. Is he going to glorify me? He's glorifying the Father. He's glorifying God. He's glorifying Jesus Christ. Jesus is speaking. He's going to glorify Christ, right? He's going to glorify. The problem is we want God's glory. And I'll give you another example of that in a few minutes. Because he will take what, take from what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus saying that the Holy Spirit will take what I've already done, what I've already said. He will be in agreement with it and he's going to deliver it to you. Isn't that awesome? Because he's God, the Holy Spirit. He is God, the Holy Spirit. I said I was giving you two examples, right? Number one, he speaks what he hears. Number two, it is, he speaks and declares what has come. And I said to you, God should not lose his glory. Acts chapter 12, beginning at verse 21. In Acts chapter 12, you will find there that there's a guy up speaking. There's Herod. Herod is up speaking. And when he spoke, the people said, Woo-wee! This is a voice of a God. This is not the voice of a man. This is a voice of God. The Bible says he spoke with such a great oration. He gave such a great speech. Until the people declare this is a voice of God, not the voice of a man. We're talking about God's glory, right? Jesus says he's going to glorify me. He's going to glorify God. The reason why we're on planet Earth is so that we can glorify God. So the people said this is the voice of a God. The next few verses tell you in, in Acts chapter 12 that the worms ate up his body. He died right there in their presence. Let me give you a picture. The room is full of people. It's a coliseum. The room is full of people. He gets up and he speaks. A campaign speech. He gets up and he speaks. And the people declare, this is the voice of a God, not a voice of a man. The Bible says that the worms immediately ate him up and he gave up the ghost and died. And when you come to the end of that peripety, it says like this, because he did not give God the glory. Make sure whatever you do, you give God the glory. Amen. Don't stay, take, don't steal God's glory. Whatever you do, 
Make sure that God gets the glory. And don't let people pump you up to take God's glory. Don't let people tell you you're so good until you accept God's glory. Make sure whatever you do, you give the glory to God. The best hurdle in the world, Sidney McLaughlin, what's her last name now? Lamar. She gives God the glory. And they criticize her by talking about Jesus. But guess what? I'm the one with the metal around my neck. And it's gold. And I'm the fastest person out here. They played a side-by-side -side video of women running a 400-meter dash with no hurdles. And she beat out the women with no hurdles as she was jumping hurdles. And when she came to the end of the finish line, she says, I just want to give glory to my God. I thank Jesus. Well, what um, allows you to do all the things you do? Well, I think it's my faith. I believe it's my faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches don't take away from God's glory. Give God the glory. People were always, Brother Whitlock preached, well, people were always, Brother Miles, talking about, whoo, boy, you sure did preach that, that, I mean, teach that thing this morning. You did a good job in your teaching this morning. Mm. To God be the glory. And I'm not talking about just saying it. I'm talking about really believing it. I'm talking about really giving God the glory. Oh, you sure do know how to do that. You do this and you do Give God the glory. It's a living example here in Acts chapter 12. This man stands to give a speech to people, recognize him as a God, and the Bible said immediately the, the worms ate him up and he gave up the ghost. He died on the spot. God deserves the glory. He has already said, you shall not have any other God that follow me. Not even yourself. I got two more paragraphs that we're going to read. And I need volunteers. Two more paragraphs. At the top of page 43, two more paragraphs. This is a summary of what we've already covered. We want to make sure that God gets the glory. One person take one paragraph and the other will ask the questions. In the Old Testament, God spoke at many times and in a variety of ways. Through Jesus, God spoke to his people. Now God speaks to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Call to your memory the things Jesus said. Guide you into all truth. Speak what he hears from the Father, tell you what is to come, and glorify Christ as he reveals to you. Does God really speak to people today? Will he reveal to you where he is working so you can join him? Yes. God has not changed. He still speaks to people. If you have trouble hearing God speak, you are in trouble at the heart of your Christian experience. Ooh, good God. Thank you. I, I don't have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't just see the light right there. The question is, does God really speak today? Is God, when the last time God said something to you? There's a group that think God speaks to nobody but them. There's a group who think God speaks to them all the time. And they'll tell you, they're always right. And then there's a group that say they can't hear from God. Are there any times that we really can't hear from him? I dare say, when we can't hear from him, is because we got other noises going on. We can't even rest in his presence. News reports said today these are uh, automated cars keeping folk up all night. They got a parking garage for automated cars, so. For, for cars that, that drive down the road and take people from one destination to the other, 
without a person being a high star grade. Ain't y'all ever ridden in a car with no driver? Mm -hmm. Raise your hand up real high if you're going to do that and try it out. You know, you, everybody needs that experience, right? Y'all going to leave that for the other generation coming behind us? That's right. Oh, y'all so old folks. Mm -hmm. I mean, this car is driving and parking and stopping and waiting with no human being in it. Mm -hmm. They got about 80 of them parked on the parking lot. And when they could get through with their drive that day, they come in and they try to park. And anytime you get a certain distance of one of these cars, they blow the horn to let you know they're there. There are people living in a high rise and those horns are blowing all day and all night. Those people can't get any sleep because there's so much other stuff going on around them. And the owner says we have to download an upgrade. So when the upgrade has expired next month, guess what's going to happen? The car's going to go to block, blowing and blocking their sleep again. And that's how it is when it comes to hearing from the Lord. When you've got so many other things going on until God can't even get a word in, as Big Mama say, edgewise. When you got everything, and see, there are some people who have convinced themselves that all good things that they're doing, they're doing it to glorify God. But you can do good things and it'll be the wrong things. Whatever blocks your attention from God is not the right thing when it comes to God. Can you give me some examples? You're doing something good, you're helping people, you're helping yourself, you're doing good things, but at the end of the day, it's not of God. Anybody? Examples. Examples. Yeah, thank you. Do you take credit for it? Of course. Okay, so Sister Woods and Sister Brown. Uh, when you do something for someone else and you take credit for it, Okay, so why is the people in the church? And I see these people in the church even more than on jobs and in the organization. He didn't call my name. I ain't ever doing anything for that church. He didn't thank me publicly. Baby, honey, darling, dude, it ain't about you. Did you do it for the sake of self grandizement or did you do it as unto the Lord? Yes, ma'am. We don't want to get started. Go ahead. Oh, no. I was, I basically was going to say the same thing. Uh, but sometimes people do that just so they can just go and brag about it. Oh. Yeah, look, look at what I did. Or right. if they say that person did something good for, for them, you know, they want their credit. Okay, so people love credit. They love their credit. But we always talk about, you don't have to call my name. And boy, if I don't call their name. So, Brown, what would happen if I really didn't call their name? Because I've had it to happen, Sister Brown. I know at the other church on the street, they don't do that. They don't act that way. But I messed up and missed somebody's name. I have to say that I have been guilty mm -hmm. of hearing when I've heard, you know, somebody giving accolades to other folks doing things that maybe I've done or just giving them accolades when I never get any accolades. Mm -hmm. And I've had to repent because I knew that that was not right. Why was I doing it? Not for their accolades, but because it was something that God had given me to do. Okay, so, so repentance is in order, yes? yes? Repentance is in order. When you know better, you repent of it and you do that, yes? And you just gotta move on. We used to give Man of the Year awards, Woman of the Year awards, and then Person of the Year awards. But no matter what, we don't do that anymore. Don't say on before your time. <laughs> That's not a good answer. Uh, it is not something that uh, 
needs to be done is something that perhaps can do more harm than good. Okay. Cause uh, dissension and strife as to who was named man of the year, woman of the year, and who may have thought they deserved to be man of the year, woman of the year. <laughs> Raise your hand if you deserve to be man of the year, woman of the year this year. Don't just raise way up in there. Come on. Let me turn the camera around. So, it, uh, Pastor John Morgan said to me, stop that stuff. He said, that doesn't do anything but cause problems. That's right. What that said to me, it doesn't matter whether you're in a black church or a white church. People think alike. And people want God's glory. When we ought to give it all to God. We sing songs about God to your glory. Lord, thank you for your amazing grace. God, we come in this house to worship you. But we really deep down inside want to be worshiped ourselves. Yes? I ain't talking about y'all, I'm talking about other people. Yes? Take, take them, please. Yes, I believe that. Go ahead. I believe that uh, it's a scripture, and I cannot remember it. It's a scripture in the word that's saying that person is already blessed because, you know, they would have just told everybody what they did, you know. So, um, even Jesus. Said that, that they're already blessed, that they're, they're not going to be blessed for the rest of their life. But mm -hmm. just because they said it, you know, that curse was put on them. So you're telling me that God blesses those who give him the glory, but he can take away or remove his blessing from those who do not, who wants his glory? We have an example, right? Yeah. The example That's is to always give. God the glory. And you gotta give it to him without thinking about it. Give him the glory without even thinking about it. I mean, it, it ought to become a common thing for you to do things for people, to do things for God. And, and Paul says in, in, in Colossians, Paul, Paul says, in all that you do, do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. Give it to God, give it to God. Because when we get our reward on the other side, it's going to be greater than anything we can receive that. The Bible says, and Sister Bernie alluded to it, is that if you get your glory from men, that's it. You don't have to worry about glory. And God's glory is so much greater than any glory that any man can give. God's glory is. I'm talking about a God that can open up one window and pull you out of blessing can open up several windows and pull you out of blessing that you have not room enough to receive. I'm talking about a God who tells us if we do these things, if we give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, run it over, shaking together and running over some more, shaking together and running over some more. Will God give into your bosom? And check this out: He gonna bring men along and do it for you. People are blessing you that don't even know why they're blessing you. It's because God moves upon their hearts. People who don't even love the Lord are blessing God's people. It is because God moves upon their hearts. And guess what God does? He takes the rewards of the wicked and gives it to the just. He's an awesome. Man stood right here, right here in this on this stage and said, my, my partners and I don't even know why we're doing this for this church. I let him finish his speech. I made sure the ink was dry on the paper. And then I said, because God contributed. $350,000 just dismissed from our loan. And he said, we don't even know why we're doing this. We ain't doing it because you asked us. We know we're not doing it because you asked us, but we don't know why we're doing this. I sit over there in the corner and I just kept quiet. 
But after the ink was dry, the contract was in my pocket. I said to him, because God has done it again. God actually blessed us and we ought to glorify him. And oftentimes tell people, don't let your blessing become your curse. Because when God blesses you and you don't give him the glory, it just became your curse. You would have been better off had she not had it. Some of our possessions can become our, our curse. Some of our kinfolk can become our curse. Some of our stuff can become our curse. But when you give it all back to God, and that's the symbolism that we face when a child family brings the child up to be blessed and given back to the Lord. Given back to the Lord. And we ought to bless our children and give them back to the Lord. Put them in God's hand because they are safer in God's hands than they are in your hands. Put them in, in God's hand. And when you do that, you'll understand that God really speaks to us. That, that God is really working around us. So we need to join him where he's at work. And yes, God has not changed. He's still blessing. He's still speaking. He's still anointing. God has not changed. I think one thing that God is, is displeased with is with the dramatization of it all. Come out of him in the name of Jesus. If God would use us to heal people and he would heal everybody, it would put MD Anderson out of business. If I had the power to walk down the hallways of Herman Memorial Hospital and just call a general assembly, <laughs> It would put, see, when you see Jesus, Jesus does it in front of some people so they can know that he is the great healer. But he never bragged about it. When they confronted him, he said, now I am the resurrection and the life. When they confronted him, he says that I am a Jew. I am educated. I do know the law. What we have to understand is that God deserves the glory. He still speaks to the people, and God is still working around us. That God is a what it looks like. And he made it possible on Calvary over 2,000 years ago. Jesus died on the cross called Calvary. Jesus was murdered on the cross, on the hill called Calvary. Men killed Jesus. He died for you and for me. He did not seek his own. But we say today he gave one for the team. He took one for the team. He took one for a team that didn't even exist yet. Die for you and me. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. Early that third day morning, he rose from the dead with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. And because he rose, he wants to get up in us tonight. The door of the church is open, the invitation is extended. Will you try him? If you never received Jesus as your personal Savior, would you just bow your head with me right now and invite him into your life? Just repeat this simple prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. I'm coming to my life. 
and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you honestly pray this prayer, trusting in Jesus as your Savior, we believe now you are born again. You're on your way to heaven when you leave earth and that you will forever be with the Lord. If you're looking for a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain of the ship, where Jesus is the main attraction, where Jesus is the center of attention. Inbox us and let us know if you received Christ tonight. And let us know if you want to be a part of this great fellowship in Southeast Houston. We'll be glad to have you. Please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. Join us Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. for Bible for, for worship service. And thank you and please continue to join us on Wednesday night at 7.15 p.m. for Bible study. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord. It is offering time. Brother Whitlock and Brother Mal showed me how to do it. It is offering time. It is offering time. It is time to give unto the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle. That's lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can mail it in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. We look forward to seeing you, talking to you. And please come by and visit with us. We are at 4251 My Road. Sure, my spell S C H U R L I E R. That's 4251 Sherman Road. S C H U R M I E R. Sherman Road, Houston, Texas 77048. That's 77048 USA. Thank you so much for joining. All right, prayer requests or praise report. Prayer requests or praise report. Amen. We're looking forward to a good time as uh, the Mississippi Delta comes to town fifth Sunday in September. We're looking forward to fifth Sunday in September. We need every hand on deck, every foot moving, every person uh, totally devoted. We'll be welcoming Pastor William Earl Reed from Indianola, Mississippi, and all the churches there will be coming to, to be a part of our service. We'll, we, we will be welcoming Pastor Earl Reed from the Mississippi Delta. Fifth Sunday, September the 29th, 2024 at our 10.30 a.m. service. Invite your family and your friends. Just so you know, um, September 7th, 2024, I will be pastoring the New Beginning Church for 20 years. Hallelujah. Next month, September the 7th, September the 7th, 2024. I'll be pastoring the New Beginning Church for 20, 20, 20 years. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We will have a celebration on September 8th. We will celebrate 20 years of successful ministry here at the New Beginning Church. Hallelujah. While we stand to our feet to be this message. Father God, that you are still speaking to us. We thank you, Lord, that you are still blessing us. 
Lord, we thank you, Father God, for how you spoke to men, women, boys, and girls in the past. We thank you for the way you're speaking to us now. We thank you for Jesus Christ, your son, who has shown us the way. And Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father God, that your word is real to us, that your word continues to bless us. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless us to walk with the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will lead, guide, direct, and counsel us and protect us. Bless us, Father God, to obey you and you alone. Bless, Father God, that we will obey the counsel of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask you to bless us as we leave this place, that you will keep us safe and in your arms. Bless our choir as they come to sing songs unto you. We ask you to bless them now in the name of Jesus. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. God bless you. You are this